for our church's use that's getting built and cool stuff is happening. So over these next um, two weeks, we're still in this sermon series. This week and next week, we're going to be uh, wrapping up our sermon series on Waymaker. How Jesus has always made the way. And he always will. There's no questions about that. That's always going to be the occurrence that happens in our lives. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from two different passages. Same story. Did you know that there's such a thing called a synoptic gospel? That means four. That means like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they, they're all talking about a similar stuff. They're giving, a, uh, giving their story about different items. And this is one of those stories that shows up in at least two different books, okay? So you can stay seated, but I'm going to read this. So the first one I'm going to read from is, is Matthew chapter 8. And so the story that we're going to be talking about is how Jesus heals a group of people with leprosy. So this is chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of leprosy. So that was Matthew's version. So here's Luke's version. This starts in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten of you cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. These are the words of the Lord. So picture this. This might not be that far off for some of us to picture. Your political beliefs put you in the small minority. The majority party, in fact, shuns you. Socially, you are considered not really a part of the nation because your ancestors were, in fact, immigrants. Spiritually, your stands made you very unpopular and often leave you confused. Morally, you have made some pretty poor decisions. Some would even call them bad. In fact, maybe you've made these decisions unwillingly and or willingly over and over and over again. And for some reason, the system that lives within you, you can't seem to break out of it. Even your gender makes it hard for you to survive, let alone thrive. But survive, you have to do. A person in that position often avoids everyone and also often trusts nobody. It would be a very lonely and frustrating and hard life to try to live. Enter into that life someone who should for all the above reasons have nothing to do with you. So this person's on the other side. Because of all those reasons listed above, this person, maybe you're casting yourself in that position now, should have nothing to do with them. And yet, they seem to not only care about you, but know you in a way that no one does, or that nobody could ever know you, and who sees, seems to have the answers to questions 
so deep that you have been afraid to ask them. Mother Teresa once said, the biggest disease in today, the biggest disease today is not leprosy or tuberculosis, uh, but rather feeling of being unwanted. That's the biggest disease today. It's feeling unwanted. The answer to this disease is shown in the healing miracle that we're considering and looking at today. Christ shows his dedication to those who are isolated. He heals the social outcasts. He grants them a new space within society and in the church. We've talked about this before. I'll say it in a different way, or maybe the same way. It is easy to love the people that make you very comfortable. It is hard to love the people who make you feel uncomfortable, simply by their presence. Through this healing, though, Christ reveals a heart for the outsider. He shows an incredible amount of love for the lonely. The leper, in this story and in history, is considered absolutely, with no questions asked in this, there's no leeway room for this, utterly unclean, physically and spiritually. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody with leprosy. I don't know that right now, at this point in your life, that you've actually seen somebody with leprosy. They pretty well got that under control. But maybe you've seen pictures. Somebody who has leprosy's body is very literally falling apart. Pieces of them are coming off. A leper, in this story, and in history, could not approach anybody within six feet. It is quite interesting when you think of even the last couple of years how that has remained consistent from biblical times to right now that we have a six foot leeway between people who we consider to be unclean. But this six feet would include everybody including and not limited to the same way we've been told, right? Family members, strangers, and acquaintances. In Leviticus chapter 13, it reads this, The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, and cover the lower part of their face. And when they walk by you, they are to cry out something. They are to cry out, I am unclean. I am unclean. Thus putting another target on them. Not only do they look a mess, but now they kind of sound a mess. As long as the individual has the infectious disease, he remains unclean. And that individual is no longer allowed to live within society. They are pushed on the outside of society. They must live in a camp. <coughs> Lepers were considered outcasts. They were totally ostracized from society. Just imagine again for just a moment, and it, maybe it's not that hard for you to think about this, but the anguish and the heartbreak of being a leper, being completely cut off, completely cut off from your friends, from your family, and from society as a whole. Imagine the emotional and mental anguish and pain that is going on from truly being considered the outsider. Let alone the physical pain of everything that was going on with the individual. We could, we could ask ourselves, who are the lepers in today's the, uh, society. Who are the outcasts? I'm very sure we can think of many. I don't think that you would have to, you know, stretch the rubber band of thought to go, hmm, I wonder who they're talking about today. 
There are those outcasts. Um, there are those who are outcasts in schools, on playgrounds, because they can't seem to fit in with the other children. There are those who are outcasts and ostracized because they live with infectious diseases as a whole right now in 2024. There are those who have different sexual orientations, those who are confused about their gender, those who look totally different and choose to look different because of you know, piercings or tattoos or if they want to wear fuzzy things on their bodies or not. Other body alterations. There are those who didn't choose to ever look or be different, and yet they are. There are those who are often cut off from society. These people are often, when you think about it, and again, you don't have to think this hard into it, not only cut off from society, but they're often cut off by their family members, by their friends, and in some cases, definitely not limited to the church. There are also those who are ostracized and outcast because they have disabilities. Sometimes uh, mental illness and mental disabilities ostracizes individuals from, again, their family, from society, from the church, from the school. And these mental illnesses have names. Did you know that? Some are schizophrenic, some are depressed, some are bipolar, some have obsessive compulsive disorders, some have post-traumatic stress disorders, there's so many. These illnesses are at times biologically based conditions that involve like actual biochemical things within the brain that do not allow them to do what we think should be normal. Mental illnesses are not caused by a lack of faith or a secret unconfessed sin or parenting styles or even a curse from God. You remember we talked about this in the past about how like if somebody was blind or somebody was deaf or somebody couldn't speak that they would blame the parents for some like undiagnosed sin in their life? That's not what it is. There's a pretty good chance that many of us, or each of us, in fact, in this room, know somebody, who at least knows somebody, or you know somebody, or you yourself are dealing with these types of problems. There is like, I don't even know the ratio. I'd call it four out of four. But sadly, like lepros, leprosy in Jesus' day, there is still a social stigma attached to all <coughs> sorts of types of afflictions. People who are struggling with addiction, mental illness, just being different than what we think should be normal, are treated like outcasts. Often they're considered annoying. I just don't want to be around them. And this only makes things worse. This is one of the reasons why, if you really look into it, suicide runs so aggressively, rampantly. Where can the folks run with mental illnesses? Some, we would hope, can run into a facility. Do they run into the church? Do people who are at most different <coughs> run to something that can find um, a moral, let's call it, compass into? Let's hope and pray that they can run into the church. Let's hope and pray, though, that we can facilitate that. Are we prepared for those things, for those people who are so vastly different than us? Can we treat individuals and and show love in ways and scenarios that are just strange to us. In our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus does not ostracize anybody. 
So back in the book of Luke, we see in verse 11 that Jesus was in the middle of his journey. He could have been heading for an important meeting. Or he could have been just tired. Exhausted. You know those times when you're just tired and exhausted? Last night I had a headache. I would maybe call it a migraine. It was like a step above that. It was like right behind my eye. Just hurt. And I just said, Leanne, I'm just I'm going to bed. It was like 9 o'clock. Which for me is a little bit early. But I just went to bed. I was tired. And I was like, I hope I can fall asleep before just like any other interruptions happen. No matter the aspirin or anything else I took, it just hurt. So I went. So maybe he could have just been tired with no times for interruption. But out of complete desperation, because remember, we said this in the past, every single time Jesus shows up on scene, something amazing happens. And so he's walking. And out of absolute desperation, these social outcasts interrupt him anyway. They still stood at a six-foot distance. They didn't run up on Jesus and try to touch the hem of his garments for healing. They stood at a distance and cried out in a loud voice. I'm assuming that means to be shouting, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Notice that within these ten outcasts was a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles. No longer was that in even contention. But normally, when we read or hear about the collection of individuals, anytime you hear in Scripture the word Samaritan come up, again, we have different views. We think of a Samaritan... For us, as the person who gives. For them, it was the person who takes. Normally, Jews did not associate with Samaritans, but again, being a total outcast and leprosy broke down every single sort of social barrier while creating absolutely new ones. Isn't it interesting how tragedy and adversity can bring people together? That make sense? We've seen it. Earthquakes, floods, fires, something terrible like uh, shootings or 9-11 or something like just like big that is just expressive in its violent, destructive, disgusting nature. Brings people together for good. Maybe that's one of the blessings God gives us. A way of helping us to figure out this puzzling life that we live in when we are devastated by some traumatic events we can at least come together and hopefully try to hold each other up the normal barriers of race or creed or class or ethnic origin of mental stability that we are artificially and at times demonically building God erases when we no longer have the luxury of just focusing on that Catch that? I think this is I think that this says to us loudly to get rid of these perverse prejudices and hatred that somehow we have learned over a long time. That is not the way that God has created us. It really just isn't. It's not how God would ever want us to look or at and or treat individuals around us. It's not what he did. Like those lepers, we are all in need of God's mercy and salvation. This should, this cry for God's mercy and salvation, bring us as people together, as people who cry out in one voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Love us. Even when we don't deserve it. Sometimes we do some really dumb stuff. And we say some things that we know we shouldn't. 
Remember those times when you might have been arguing with a spouse and you know, I know how to hurt you the most. I also am the one who loves you the most. And we can say and do things that we wish we could just take back. <laughs> Too late. You've already said it. And sometimes sorry is just not enough. It requires actions of changes. Have pity on us. And that's exactly what Jesus did for these lepers. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He has absolute love for us. That's where we live. And this is exactly what we are to have for each other. Pity is a weird word. I don't, I don't know if I always liked that idea. Like, pity I, it means like, hey, feel sorry for me. So maybe you have to change the definition a little bit or really read into it. Because we are to have concern for others. To have empathy for others. To have kindness for others. To like, love from the very center of who we are. I heard this story about a church that decided to rent out, like, a, we'll call it a town square, or a place to hold a picnic at the pavilion, okay, for their community, or for the community, in fact. Like, it was for their church community, and they were in hopes going to be opening it up for other people in the community to come join them in, in worship and fellowship and food, right? They decided that it would be a great evangelical reach, uh, opportunity for them to reach out to their neighbors. A wonderful way for them to get to know them. To invite them to church. Invite them, hopefully, not just into the church, but like, have an opportunity for salvation. Right? Like, hey, we know this Jesus. Do you know this Jesus? But here as it, as it comes, it turns out a number, a good number of folks did turn out for the affair, but they weren't the people or the kinds of people that the church was envisioning would show up for the picnic. Many of those who responded to the church's invitation for fellowship were poor. They had no income, but they were hungry. So they came from lower socioeconomic parts of town. The majority of the individuals that showed up were a different race. Many were not dressed in clean clothing. Some you could have assumed had addictions or mental illnesses or different things that were going on, which in fact got on the nerves of the church folk that were there hosting the picnic. The people who showed up for the picnic were nice enough, and that wasn't the issue. The problem was they didn't have anything to offer. Their skin was different colors. Many of them had different handicaps and things which just ruined all the fun. How would we have our cornhole competitions if you didn't know how to do these things? The guests turned out to be annoying. To be so annoying that the people that, in this, that this church had who were hosting an event to bring people in, didn't want anything to do with them. And for some of those people, they just asked for them to go away. This is the last time they acted on this brilliant evangelical um, idea, this invitational idea. What a shame that is. God is very strong in his call upon us to care for those who are marginalized and outcasted. God has a clear concern for classes of people like aliens, like widows, orphans, and the different. These are people God values and whom God's people are supposed to value as well. As Christians, we are called to imitate God. 
And God, through the prophet Isaiah, would tell us that we should learn to do good, to seek justice, and rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Again and again and again. In the New Testament, Jesus reaches out to those who are Christians. We must remember, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. You hear that? As Christians, we must remember that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Like calling the pastor in the middle of a sermon. Tell you what. They really needed you. You know? As Christians, we are urged to put on Christ. Or as the Philippians instruct, as, as Philippians instructs us, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We are called to see others and respond to others as Jesus himself would. To have the same mind or same attitude towards other human beings. Many times we claim to want to reach out to the marginalized and the poor. But we don't want to have to touch them. We don't want them touching us or coming close to us. And we certainly don't want them talking to us, wanting them to get to know us, or wanting to become our friends. We've shared this before. It's an easy illustration, because I know 99% of us have experienced it. When we drive through cities that have intersections and different things like that, and we have veterans or somebody who wants to write a sign that says, I'm hungry. How many times we have just looked at the floor or tried to change our radio station, or even looked and said, ah, I, have, I don't have change, but I have cash, but this is a big bill, and I was going to use this big bill for this. The book of Genesis explains that humankind was created in the image of God. This means that we are all manifestations of the divine and the sacred. And as long as the marginalized, as long as people look different, smell different, act different, think different, live different, are forced to be in exile from the spiritual communities, which is the church. An aspect of God, an aspect of the sacred is in exile as well. And that is hard. The presence of God cannot fully dwell within a church that has no place for people with differences. We cannot be whole when a part of the community is absolutely absent and or invisible. There is a mutual need for healing here, people. People living with differences need healing, and the church needs healing. That's a big piece. We need the healing as well. In the sense often that we need to move towards wholeness. In the Church of the Nazarene, when we talk about wholeness, it's a word that's very similar in its presentation. We're talking about holiness. We're talking about pure worship. We're talking about falling at the feet of the king and offering him all of ourselves. The people. I've come to know who are living with differences have the same essential longings as most people. 60 plus people meet on a Monday night. That is their community. They are longing to be a part of community. That is one minute example. Longing for community. Often talking about the God of their understanding. May we be able to express the God of ours. They long to feel welcome. 
They long to have a sense of belonging, and many of them long to live within the loving community of faith with which God calls the church. Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God made flesh. And Jesus Christ made it very clear that no one is an outcast in his kingdom. The observation here is that these lepers were shunned from society for their diseases. It was contagious. It was thought to come from hidden sins in their life. Wouldn't it be so unique if our faith in Jesus Christ was considered contagious to the point where listen, if I stand within six feet of these people I might catch something pleasant <laughs> you know that's why I like those plugging things that you can plug into the little sense that within certain areas I like to turn them real low and walk away for a while like plug it in down downstairs in the boardroom and for some reason it's not the smell I don't know why it smells like bananas but it does <laughs> but it's a good smell it's contagious if I leave stuff in that room and I take it out I'm not saying that I smell books but I'm saying like you might catch <laughs> the waft of these smells it's contagious can you imagine if we in our faith were considered that way that it's contagious. I've seen and been a part of churches where the faith of the believers was contagious. I want to be a part of that. Jesus showed up and they realized that he was the only one who could fix their issues. They called out to him from a distance which was required they were like the walking dead. They realized that they had a deadly problem. And their cry out to Jesus was the only resolution for them. Nobody else could fix it for them. No program, no medication, no nothing. No waters that they could run into. You'll hear stories of like that in, in the scripture that waters of healing they would have to run at the time that they blew a whistle or clapped or something and they could get in before everybody else they could potentially be healed Jesus comes to them and he meets with them in their point of need the word of God tells us that Jesus will meet us at our point of need without touching him without the perfect prayer he tells these individuals in the sense of healing, why don't you go see the priests now? The priests at that time would condemn and ban the lepers from their, fam from their family, from the workforce, throw them out of the city, and the priest was the only one who could pronounce the leper healed and reconnect them with their family. The priests were not the doctors, but the priest held that standing. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And away they went. They were cleansed. This took faith on the part of all ten lepers. They were not healed instantly. In fact, I believe that they were healed as they went, and they were being cleansed as they went. They realized they had a problem that only Jesus could have fixed. They admitted to their need and they cried out to God. They, ex they accepted by faith the words that he had spoken. God's power was not released until they stepped out in faith. And so they stepped out in faith and they experienced his healing power. Can you imagine as they walked, leprosy gave you a bunch of scabs and things like that all over their body. The scabs and things just started falling off instead of body parts. Things probably came back into wholeness and healing. Things that went missing maybe reappeared. 
Faith is trusting and obeying God even if you don't have any evidence, though, supporting your decision. They didn't say, Jesus, heal me first, and then I'll go show him. Like, let all the fingers grow back on, and all the scabs and scales fall off, and then I'll show him. They moved by faith. They were moved by faith at the words and the directions of Jesus Christ. Peter, while he was scared in a boat in a raging sea, yelled at Jesus, Tell me to come out to the water. Jesus said, Come. And Peter was then able to beat all the odds for some moments and then walk on water. But then when he took his eyes off of Jesus, because he realized what he was doing, he began to sink. The words say of the lepers, as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. So the lesson, another lesson here, is 10 lepers got, lepers got healed. 90% of them did not come back and acknowledge the healing. Only 10% came back. Jesus said the one who came back was a foreigner, a Samaritan. Meaning the Jews, the chosen people of God, did not, and a foreigner did. Acknowledging God in his presence and praising God. When crisis hit, these ten lepers, they bonded together. The barrier of Jews and Samaritans was broken. Sometimes God has to bring us to hard times to get some barriers broken. Sometimes to cause us to come back and at times just say thank you. Interestingly, Christ does not use, the wor use words to heal them, but simply tells them to have the priest look them over for disease, which again is what the law demanded that them to do. In other words, their act of faith, not their words or Jesus' words, and seeking out the priest prompted their healing. Despite all the lepers having significant faith to go see the priest, only one of them returns. Perhaps the one who was most least expected to return. Jews were alienated from one another as seen in Christ's dismay over the nine who were absent. As he says, where are the others? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for the foreigner? <clears throat> and yet, this is the one who is told that his faith made him well. An affirmation of his salvation. That he has been saved in soul and body and accepted into the family of God. Something that first century Jews would scoff at. A survey that was made by Harvard found that during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has deepened people's feelings of isolation and loneliness. It said 61% of young adults and 51% of mothers of young children felt serious loneliness. It makes me often think of those who don't receive or see a visitation for a very, very long time. While Christ's followers may still feel loneliness, Christ provides a way for them to be accepted and loved through his sacrifice. The church should be the physical manifestation of his healing. 
in granting space to outcasts. If Christ can heal the outcast, then he is able to care for and love the lonely and the isolated. In other words, this miracle shows us that Christ grants the lonely a community, a body to be a part of, meaning the church, as a means to heal the outcast. If you are feeling lonely, if you are feeling isolated, you're not alone. This is a good place to come to. If you are not feeling isolated or lonely, reach out to someone you think might is. That's a good opportunity to be the hands and feet. We can take part in the work of Christ by loving the lonely. We have incredible opportunities to be those hands and feet. May we do so. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that is laid out in it. We thank you for the boldness to be able to speak it. Sometimes when we speak it, we say things that get a little bit mixed up. Father, may you grant clarity in our words. May you provide truth where it needs to be laid out. Father, may we be hands and feet. May we be instruments of your love and your grace. May we be instruments able to make beautiful noises and sounds that speak to your holy word. Father, we cling on to the truth that you will set the captives free. For those who are shunned and set out aside, move the way. Father, I don't just ask for you to get rid of their shame, but Father, I ask in their faith that they may be healed, reconciled to you. With boldness, we pray these things. We thank you. It's in your great name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Know that you are loved. May you not be lonely. May you stand in his presence and in the presence of others. You are dismissed.